Let's do a song. Um, I'm gonna do a song from the Red Back Hymnal, and a song everybody knows, so sing on with me. It's called Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story How the Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atonement Then I repented of my sin And won the victory Um, 
music and not and Mario will feel in the world. Yeah. Anyone else? Just remember Christian too. Uh, Kara's fiance. He's not feeling well and I either should have him in. <laughs> we had uh, five uh, on my mind where I work at had COVID been out all week so we had work short short handed for next all week. Start the night off with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity. I pray that you just touch each and every request that was answered. Lord, <laughs> my memory is very limited, but I pray that you just touch each and every single person. Yes. Lord, I've heard a lot about people battling this sickness. So, Lord, I pray that you just bring healing to their body. And Lord, even if you don't, let them be able to have faith and know that you have a plan for them. Lord, I pray that you just give them strength through this struggling time. Lord, keep your hand over our nation including the military, from the young people. Lord, I pray that they all be able to focus on what truly matters. I pray that they be able to move their eyes back to you and be able to lead this country in your way. Lord, I pray that you just touch each and every person here tonight. Lord, you know the, the requests that were so dear and precious that they were not said. Lord, keep your hand over those who weren't able to make it tonight, and I pray that they'll be able to make it <laughs> Sunday and every other night until then. Lord, I pray that you just keep your hand over the service. Lord, anoint our ears so that we may be able to hear the words that you have for us. In your own mighty name, name, I pray. Amen. 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 Sorry again for not doing everyone, uh, so what? you know, my, name, my, my memory is terrible. <laughs> so, you have been up here quite a few times. You, you know how I like to start this. I like to give a little bit of a preface. So a few weeks ago, I was at Celebrate Recovery, and I attend one of the uh, men's groups there for you know a certain addiction, and I had just poured out my heart about you know me not fully understanding God's grace. You know we're we're taught about it in church, and we know what the Bible says, but something just hasn't clicked for me. You know, and I just poured out my heart, and I'm like, I don't understand how. We can do all of these horrible things, and yet all we have to do is ask God to forgive us, and He is faithful and just to do so. And I felt a strong, I'll say a strong urge to flip to a very specific scripture. So tonight, I'll be preaching on the way to salvation. Our message comes from Romans 5, Romans 5, 15 through 17. And I'll be flipping there with you guys because I didn't put a bookmark in there. Alright? And you with me saying that? Amen. Starting in verse 15. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought, brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God, God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in the life through one man, Jesus Christ? So, before we uh, begin, I'd like to, you know, pray one more time just over the, the message, if that's okay with everyone. Sure. All right? Please bow your heads. Lord, again, thank you for tonight. I pray that you just bless my lips so that I may be able to give this message the way that I have received it. 
Lord, I pray that you just move me out of the way and fill me with your Holy Spirit so that you may speak through me. Lord, I pray that you anoint each and everyone's ears and their hearts so that they may be able to fully receive this message. Lord, I pray that you just touch the people watching tonight, whether they know you or not, that they will be able to receive you and know more about you at the end of this service. In your almighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, start this off. Please work. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so, what trespasser is he talking about? Because he said, you know, the, the trespasses of one man reigned throughout, you know, all of history until Jesus Christ. Well, the trespass that he's talking about is Adam and Eve. The word trespass means to fall aside, and it includes the idea of a false step or blunder. To back this up, uh, if you guys would, turn to Genesis 3, and we'll be hopping around a little bit. We'll start in verse 6. start this sermon off, we got to start from the very beginning. Genesis 3, starting in verse 6. If you're there with me, say amen. amen. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Going to verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking through the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Skipping down to verse 23. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. So, starting this off, I know I skipped a whole chunk <laughs> right in the middle there, and I, I apologize for that. Uh, I'm going to try and you know keep it brief. I don't want to keep you guys here all night. <laughs> but uh, to, to start this off, you know, God created Adam and Eve, and He, you know, they were among all of the animals, and they were able to do whatever they wanted. You know, I imagine Adam being able to walk over to the tiger and be able to be like, "Hey, come here." The tiger just laying in his lap and him, you know, stroking it. Or Eve, Eve looking at Adam, and be like, "You want to go on a cruise?" Adam looks at her and says, yeah, sure. <laughs> so they both hop on the back of the dolphin and they just go through the <laughs> dolphin, you know? I, I don't know all that was there. They were able to do anything. And God gave them one command. All of this is yours. You're hungry? Go take a fruit. We have apples, bananas, pineapples, grapes. We, we've got all of this. But don't touch this tree. Humans being humans, curiosity got the better of them. Eve walks over to the tree and looks up. He just kind of ponders it a little bit. All of a sudden, the snake slithers down. Hey, you want a bite? Oh, I can't take a bite of that. God said that I would die. Surely he didn't mean that. I mean, the only reason he doesn't want you to eat this is because you'll know things like he does. Hmm. And, I mean, look at it. It's plump, it's ripe. These are the juiciest fruits in the entire garden. You know you want some. You're not going to die. Just one bite. One bite. That's all you need. She bites into it. And then what does she do? Oh, Adam, try this. What does Adam do? No, okay. <laughs> you know, he, he, he looks at it and he's like, uh, Eve is obviously not laying on the down ground dead, so Maybe God was wrong. We're not going to die. He takes a bite of it. All of a sudden, their, their entire bodies are just filled with this wisdom that they shouldn't have had in the first place. And they look down and, oh. <laughs> and then they hear God walking. Oh, uh, we need to cover up. This is a, they cover up and they hide. Because they broke that one command, they were kicked out of the garden. This is the first instance of sin into the world. And, you know, I, I'm on a, you know, a Christian meme, uh, meme page, and uh, 
one of them that kind of stuck out to me was a, it said, Adam and Eve sharing notes. He showed a picture of Eve running away from like a swarm of bees being like, don't try to get the honey. And Adam with like a prawn or something on his arm be like, prawners are no longer friendly. Because <laughs> you've got to imagine these people were in literal heaven, heaven on earth. And yet they did that one sin and because of that one disobedience they were kicked out. I hope you've all brought your notebooks because we're going to be going through a little bit of civics. <laughs> so I've been watching a quite a bit of apologetics and a great comfort just trying to understand how I can better share the gospel. So with this, I'm going to be giving an example, trying to go through each of my points so that not only can we understand it better, but we may be able to present it to those who may not understand all of our verbiage. So start this off. You have been found guilty of a crime. You were caught in the act. Your hands literally stained with red. The evidence, they have every piece of evidence that they can find. There is no possible way that you can twist and turn it to where you're, you're, you're uh, innocent. You yourself plead guilty. Cement law. So what, uh, a couple words that I'll be uh, saying is, you know, the word sin and law. Well, what is law? Law is found in the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy 5, 6 to 21. Now, I will be, this part will be quite a bit of scripture. That this is to show that, you know, this is to give you an outline of what it actually says. Not just the, you know, I know that we have in our room the, the Ten Commandments and it's two sentences, but I'd like to see what the scripture truly says. So if you're there with me, say amen. amen. Starting in verse 6. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make your, for yourself an image of the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath them the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Honor your father and mother, as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live long and that it may, may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false witness and false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife. You shall not desire on your neighbor's house or land his male or female servant, his ox, not even for anything that belongs to your neighbor. So, I'm not going to make any of you guys, you know, raise your hand, but how many has lied at any time in their life? How many of you have lied? Okay? Yeah. What does that make you? You're a liar. How many of you have stolen anything? Whether it be like a, a dollar bill or maybe a piece of gum at Walmart? What does that make you? A thief. So by the words of your own mouth, you are a lying thief. How are any of us righteous? Continuing with it. Why not? Now continuing with our example. The judge pulls out the law of the land and begins to weigh the penalty. You begin to tremble, afraid of what consequences may follow. Because you know what the law says. You know that you have done something against the law, and you know that something must happen. 
Next, the penalty of sin. Well, define, well to define that, we have to go to Romans 4.15. Romans 4.15 says, Because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. In Romans 5.20 it says, uh, that the law made sin increase. That is not saying that because the law came along, <coughs> sin was abundant. You know, like rabbits having babies. It didn't just boom, it didn't explode when the law came. What it means is that whenever the law came, it made it bigger. So now the thing that was so small that you can barely tell it's there, now you know what the law says. So you can obviously tell when somebody's doing it wrong. And you may ask, well, if everyone was, you know, okay and living in their sin and they were fine, why was the law even given? I'd like to give you a, a little bit of a, an example, another example. So imagine a sunny day at the beach. You spent your entire life saving for this moment. You finally get to the beach, you know, you're absorbing the sun rays, you're so warm, and you jump into the water and you just start swimming and you're enjoying every moment of it. And all of a sudden, you poke your head up and something catches your eye. You see a sign. On closer inspection, it says, no swimming allowed. Mm. Sharks nearby. Your entire day is ruined. But was it the sign's fault? Was the, did the person that put up that sign ruin your day? No. No. <laughs> so you're reading that. And not only are you, you know, happy it's there because now you can get out of the water and move. But so many people, they look at the law and they're like, well, God's just ruined my day. He says, I can't do this, 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 this. It's not because he doesn't want you to have fun. Right. You know, reading that, none of that looks really fun. I don't want to covet my neighbor's anything. I mean, I don't have a job and I'm not coveting his donkey over there. I'm, <laughs> you know, I, I can save enough money and buy my own. Or, uh, yeah, there. Yeah, see, <laughs> see no, none of that seems fun. You know, murdering. You've seen countless. Uh, no, what's the word I'm looking for? Countless documentaries on the different serial killers. That don't look too fun. At least not to me. Uh, you know. If, that sounds fun to you, you know, <laughs> but I'll leave that for, you know, somebody else to do it with, but, you know, none of that seems fun. The law is essential to know what God has planned for us, but it's not a solution for the sharks. Us having the law right here does not mean that all sin is just going to go whoop. In fact, it says that when the law was given, Sin abounded. Again, not because it was like rabbits making babies, but that you could now see the thing that was made so small. Mm -hmm. Another reason the law was given is because sin is like small. It's not visible while you're in the middle of it. What the law does is it takes you out of that smog of your own mentality and takes you into heaven's view to see what's the problem. It makes the sinner or it allows the sinner to have knowledge of his own sin. Now, what's the penalty of said sin? <clears throat> James 1.15 says, Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. My uncle was over here, and <laughs> I was trying to explain a game to him, and he looked at me and he said, I wasn't in the army, you don't have to... You don't have to show me. You can just tell me and I'll know it. But I am very visual, so I'll give you guys another example because I like examples. So, you're, you're sitting down in your kitchen and you're home alone. And you have a voluptuous triple chocolate cake on your table. And you're on a diet because so you know what that chocolate cake does to you. After desire is conceived, you look at that chocolate cake, you know how it tastes, you want a piece of that chocolate cake. Desire has been conceived. After desire has been conceived, it gives birth to sin. Slice off a piece of that cake and take that first bite. You have already sinned. It gives birth to sin. And that sin, when it is full grown, you finish that piece of cake, gives birth to death. 
You either finish the one piece of cake and you gain a pound, or you eat the entire cake and gain 30. <laughs> there is a penalty for our actions. Again, back to our example. The judge puts down the book and tells you that you must pay penance to be let free, or you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison. The fine that you must pay is $200 million Whoa. in order to be let free. What you have done is so grievous that it requires that amount of work. And you might be looking at me and being like, well, you, you just told me that you know, I'm going to die and go to hell. I, I ain't righteous. There's nothing that I can do to get me out of this because I ain't paying $200 million. I ain't got that in my bank account. You're looking at me and you seem hopeless. Because what I just told you, none of us are going to hell. We're all messed up. We're all going to hell, right? I'm going to bring up three words. Atonement. Grace. Faith. Now, to the untrained listener, <laughs> or someone who hasn't been in church all of their life like I have, you may not understand these words. Or, you may be like me, and you know exactly what the words mean. But you're asked to define them, and you have no idea what, how to define them. You know, like, define big. It's big. <laughs> you know, how do you, how do you define these words? So I'm going to try and, my, uh, my main goal for this sermon is to give you all a hunger for what the Word of God truly says and to hopefully demystify the Word so that not only you know what you believe, but you know that you believe it. Amen. And that you have such a grasp on it that you're able to look at somebody else who doesn't know anything about it and say, here. And not give them crazy words that they're going to have to go home later and look up and you know, go down a rabbit trail and find 30 million reasons why they shouldn't believe that. But that you can take them right here, explain everything to them, and if they want to go home and research, more fun. So, the first word, this is word, there we go, is atonement. Atonement, or the atonement that I'm using, is found in the Old Testament. The English definition of atonement is reparation for a wrong or injury. The scripture I'm going to be using is Exodus 30.10. It says, once a year, Aaron shall make atonement on its horns. But the annual atonement must be made with the blood of the atoning sin offering. For the generations to come, it is most holy to the Lord. That was a whole lot of atoning and not a lot of understanding, right? Now... Uh, if you guys would like more on the, uh, you know, uh, why Exodus, Deuteronomy, why these are important, I watched a, uh, it was about a 30 minute series on the Old Testament books, going through what the Jews believe from the Bible Project, and that's kind of where I got my background from this. The Hebrew word for atonement is kippur. It means redemption. It is found seven times in seven verses. Wow. Normally, when this word is used, it, an animal was sacrificed for the cleansing of a sin or the offering of worship unto God. In this case, the blood of the animal was symbolically washing away the sins done. Again, in that video, it showed a, a person with a bowl of the animal's blood. And he would dip his hands in it and sprinkle the blood across the four corners of the temple. Mm -hmm. And what that was doing was symbolically washing away the sins that were done in that land. So, the penalty of sin is death. Atonement. Right. Dead animals. Blood everywhere. You know, washing your sins. Or, the eventual death of the person. Either way, death must happen. Back to the example. <laughs> You reach into your pocket and pull out your wallet. You remove a $5 bill from it. There's no way you'll ever come close to paying off this debt. You begin to tremble. If you can't pay the fine, you're gonna to have to spend the rest of your life in prison. The next word, grace. 
the, now, uh, for the example, I'm using the New Testament whenever Jesus was alive. The English uh, meaning of grace is courteous goodwill. That was one of the different definitions. There were quite a few. And the scripture I'm using is John 1, 16 through 17. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and through truth came through Jesus Christ. And what that means is God gave us grace whenever he gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Because if he wouldn't have, that sin would have still been like this. Yeah. He gave grace in place of grace. The Ten Commandments. Now comes Jesus, who not only fulfilled them all, but was actually, you know, he could move and talk, unlike a couple of stone tablets. He could look at you and say, you're doing this, you need to stop doing this and do this. The Greek word used for charis, the Greek word used for grace is charis. I can't roll the R because I suck at Spanish. <laughs> but it translates into yeah. <laughs> But the word translates into favor. There's something interesting. It's found 156 times in 147 verses in the Greek alone. I didn't do, you know, for the the inter language and thing of above, but you know, that's already a whole lot more than the word atonement. Jesus said that he was able to he was able to forgive sins. Luke 7 48 says, Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. If it were not for the grace of God, Jesus wouldn't have walked among us. Jesus also showed us grace. In examples, uh, the man in the pool of Bethesda. He could have walked over, looked in the pool and said, he's like five feet away from the pool, I'll just walk on. Or the, uh, the, I believe it was the government official whose son was sick, and he came to Jesus. He traveled all this way and pleaded with Jesus, please heal my son. Jesus could have done two things. We know what he did, but he could have just looked at him and said, dude, your house is like, 500 miles away. Just go. Um, you can stay. You can walk with me. I'm not going to do anything, but you can walk with me. You can watch me do all this other stuff, you know? But what did he do? He looked at him and said, Your son is healed. Mm -hmm. he did, now, he didn't do what the government official wanted him to do. He didn't go with him. And he said, Your son is healed. And with. Nope. Wrong word. <laughs> wrong word. But he looked. Or he he tried, took Jesus on his word. What did he do? He went home. On his way home, one of his servants met him in the middle and says, Master, your son is healed. And then he looks at him and says, what, what time did this happen? I'm, I don't have a photographic memory, so I'll say, three o'clock. <laughs> and the man you know, ponders and he's like, three o'clock. That was when Jesus told me he was healed. Right there, Jesus showed him grace. Because Jesus could have lied, which would have broken, you know, the, the Ten Commandments, which would have made his sacrifice null. But he, he gave him grace and did what he had asked. Back to the example. The judge knows that there is nothing you can do to pay what the law requires. Out of compassion, he looks at you, he reaches down his hand, and offers you to or offers you help. Wow. The next word is faith. Uh, again, the example, I, I'm using, you know, kind of block examples to kind of uh, give you guys an idea of what I'm trying to go for. But the, uh, the example here is the New Testament. Acts, Romans, Ephesians, today. Please do not look in your Bible for a chapter or a book called today. It's, it's not going to be in there. But uh, many people, including myself, believe that we are the continuation of Acts because Acts does not have an ending. And, you know, I had heard that for, you know, years and I had never read the end of Acts. So a couple days ago, I slipped through it and I read the end of it and I'm like, oh, that's weird. You know, it doesn't have an official ending like most of the other books. So... Again, I believe that we are the continuation of it. The English definition of faith is complete trust or confidence. 
The scripture I'll be using is Ephesians 2.8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but free is the gift of God, eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The Greek word is pistis. I know I butchered that, but <laughs> it means assurance. And here's something else interesting. It's found 244 times in 228 verses. More than both grace and atonement combined. Quite literally. Is, you know, 144 plus 4 is not going to get over 200. I mean, I ain't that good at math, but I know that much. In the Gospels and the other books, Acts as well as, you know, other ones, uh, there were accounts of people being healed because of their faith. Paul also tells us in Ephesians that through our faith, we are saved. Again, going back to uh, the pool of the, or the man in Bethesda, if he wouldn't have had any faith, do you think that anything would have happened? And how did Paul and the disciples follow Jesus? I mean, if they didn't have any faith in him, then they would just be following, I'll just say, a cult leader? If he was just walking around claiming all of these things and not showing anything, they had no faith in him, they were just following him. That's right. That nullifies everything, right? Back to the example. You accept his offer, and you think that the finder is just going to disappear. But the judge knows that the fine is, must be paid. So he steps down, he takes off his robe, he reaches into his pocket, and pays the bill. Now, on the surface, that doesn't seem really great, you know? You know, cool, atonement, grace, faith, those words are found in the Bible. Awesome, I'm a... What does that mean again? The good news is found in the salvation story of Jesus. In the beginning of time, God created everything in the Garden of Eden. Sin, sin was introduced to Adam and through Adam and Eve. The world became more and more corrupt until it was destroyed in the flood. God gave Moses the law so that the people could live a holy life, pleasing and pleasing to God. But God could God knew that they wouldn't be able to do it on their own, so he promised a Messiah. Time went by, and again the Israelites became more and more corrupt. Through God's grace, Jesus was sent to the earth. He showed himself to be the Messiah, and many came to faith in him. Through God's grace, People were healed and forgiven of sins. But Jesus also knew that there ultimately had to be a price. Because again, these people were doing sacrifices while Jesus was walking around. Jesus became the perfect sacrifice of atonement. The spotless lamb without sin or blemish. He took our sins upon us. Romans 5, 6-8 says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, people might. <laughs> but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, he died for us. Now when we come to faith in Jesus, his grace is given to us, and our sins are atoned for. So, how is anyone saved? The answer is simple. You believe. Romans 10, 8 through 10 says, in fact, it says, the message is very close at hand, and it is on your lips and in your heart. And that message is the very message of faith that we preach. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is believing with your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. Two of the words I've explained tonight we can't do. I mean, if you, please raise your hand if you have seen any church or uh, any Christian go out, take their favorite goat and sacrifice it. Has anyone seen that? Okay, has anyone seen people splatting blood on the four corners of the church? No? No. So we, we can't atone for our own sins. In that example I gave, there is no way you can pay the price of the debt that must be paid. We cannot give ourselves grace. 
you know, we can forgive ourselves, and that's all great and wonderful, but we can't give ourselves the grace that's supposed to come from God. I can't sin and be like, I'm Caden, I'm going to just, I'm forgiven, I'll be fine, and walk off and keep on sinning. I can't do that. But there is one word that we are called to do, and that's to have faith. That's what we're called to do. Because through our faith, God, again, gives us His grace, and the sacrifice has already been made. So through that grace, we have been atoned for. I normally try and lead a sinner's prayer, I say. And that's great. I, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to lead. If you do not know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you can follow me and you can take what I'm about to pray as an example. But that take, if you're copying what I'm saying, it's taking one key, important, key point out of it. You're not praying you, you're praying me. God wants your heart. My mom cannot pray the same prayer I have and have it come from her heart. Because she's hearing what I'm saying and she's saying the same stuff. So if you do come to Christ tonight, please reach inside of your heart and pour out to God. He wants you to be sincere. Please bow your heads. Lord, again, I thank you for tonight. Lord, I pray that you just touch each and every single one of us. I pray that you just give us a hunger for your word. Lord, I pray that you just set us on fire for you again, knowing that what you have done for us is something that we could have never done for ourselves. Lord, let us go out into the world and be able to share this with others so that they may have the same joy that we have, the same assurance, the same peace that we have. Lord, I pray that you just set us on fire. Lord, I pray that you just open our words, your word to us, so that we may be able to read it and read it and read it and it seem like we never get enough. Lord, thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. Lord, I believe that you died for me. I know that you lived. I know that you rose again. And I know that one day you'll be coming back. Lord, right now I just ask you to forgive me of every sin that I have committed. Lord, I pray that you just touch, clean me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Touch my mind so that I may, I may not have the thoughts that I had before. Lord, touch my hands so that I may not be able to do the things I've done before. Lord, melt down this heart of stone that I have so that I may be able to have compassion on others. Lord, touch us so that we may be able to go out into the world and be your church. In Jesus' almighty name I pray. Amen. 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 Give the Lord a big hand. Give the Lord a big hand. Give the Lord a big hand. He just keeps getting better and better, and I really enjoy it. I have to pray back there, though, Brother Kate, because to be honest with you, I get a little covetous of those incredible slides. I think I'm going to hire him, uh, <coughs> you know, or volunteer tell him, <laughs> and send him my, to my, my sermons for Sunday, and he can do the slides. It's, I don't know about you, but the animation helps me. I don't know. I just I, I enjoy that, and I'm so proud of him and proud of what the Lord's doing in his life. But uh, Brother Kate, too, just to tackle an incredible subject. I mean, be, be honest, how many tonight, I mean, you feel a little more clarity about God's grace and mercy for you. And, you know, we as men, I think that when we're younger, we accept grace a little bit easier because that's what we've been given. But when we become adults, and I think that we make these decisions and we have to deal with the ramifications of our own actions, I think that's where we're really, I mean, honest to goodness, it, it, we really don't understand it anymore. One thing Kate brought up so amazingly, of course, he did everything, but remember, guys, it's not, even in, even in the book of John, John says it's not our love for him, but it's his love for us. And it's hard to fathom that. And I'm going to leave you with one scripture, not to, not to anything that he's done. It's just been amazing. But one thing I was sitting back there, and John MacArthur said something, and it's just it's so weighed in my heart, is uh, I, I think it is in 2 Corinthians 5, 19. Uh, don't quote me on that. You might look it up. My, I think that's exactly where it is. But anyway, it's where the Apostle Paul reminds us that he, talking about Jesus, who had no sin was made sin so that you and I could become the righteousness of God. I mean, what that means is this, is when Jesus was on the cross as the sinless sacrifice of humanity, giving us that redemption, amen, giving us that justification, 
When God looked at Jesus on the cross, he didn't see Jesus in that moment. He saw you and I. All of our sin we would ever commit, everything we would ever do, everything we would ever do wrong, all the hardships, he saw that. And because Jesus was took that to the cross and gave his life, guess what, family of faith? We that believe in him, now when God sees us, he sees Jesus. Amen. And it's an incredible gift, but it is a gift. So one thing, if I could echo Kate too, is when you walk out of today, you guys, if you're a believer, you should be on, be on cloud 295. There should be no way you walk out of here unhappy or without joy in your heart. It's because, remember, you are guilty. We're all guilty. But what he said was, is grace means and mercy means and redemption means that the judge himself, not a prosecutor and not some just intermediary, but the only righteous judge come around the, 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 that, that courtroom, took his own cloak off, become the prosecuted and paid the bill because he had the ability when he knew you and I don't have it. Amen. Amen. And the thing is, how do we receive that? In all your conclusion, Kate, and it does seem so simple, but remember it's not. It's an all, it's everything. When we believe, it changes everything. When we say we believe, we, we treat things different, we act different, not because it's a quote-unquote law, but because now we have a new set of belief. We believe that God is, so we act different, and we treat each other different, we treat one another different. Amen? Amen. Again, give Kate a big hand. Man, oh, he's got a good pastor. Honestly. <laughs> but anyway, all right, we're going to dismiss. Uh, he's already prayed you out. But Sister Linda, when's our next uh, Esther's Court? Tuesday. This coming Tuesday's Esther's Court. Sister Dawn, when's our next women's ministry? Third Sunday of this month. Third Sunday. I think that's coming up. Is it next Sunday? No. Uh, this next Sunday will be the first Sunday. Oh, okay. That's right. No, this next Sunday is the last Sunday of the month. Yeah. Yeah, but that's it. Yeah. Four weeks. Anyway. Well, the sickness has gotten us Sunday, yes. Yes, yes. Amen. <laughs> Tuesday at 6.30 again, brother, right? It's coming Tuesday, 6.30, family Bible study. Yep. Amen. What book of Acts are we in? Uh, 10. Verse 1 and 2. And <laughs> uh, 23. All right. And you might. If everyone participates well, you might get to verse 22 or 24, 25. It's incredible. You guys got to enjoy that. Again, be praying much for us too because we know I look Brother James. It's not going to be long. Rangers are going to kick off on some events again. Uh, so it's going to be this year. Boy, this year is in a, in a hurry to get here. So anyway, may I let you know this, guys, whether you're watching on Facebook or whether you're here, I hope you know how loved you are. God loves you. We love you. And uh, I'm just expecting great things. Uh, working through God. Let's remember all those that are sick with COVID and all this other stuff. And uh, and again, don't be afraid to be faith filled. Amen. Amen. May God richly bless you. He prayed for you. Y'all yeah. dismissed. Amen. Amen. Amen.